This is BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU-TV and BYU-Radio. Now live from Studio C, here's Jerem Jordan and Jason Shepard. Yo, what's up? BYU Sports Nation is live. Your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio C, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Tuesday, August 2nd. Thanks for being here. I am Jerem Jordan, teamed up with guy who's looking forward to getting his fresh equipment tomorrow. Jason Shepard. Ah, yes. That time of year where we drool over all of the new Nike gear being handed out to the players. (laughs) Like, literally, we're, like, staring at our phones going, oh, my gosh, that looks amazing. Every time we see a a new (laughs) shot of gear, I'm like, oh, I could really use those. Even if I couldn't use them, I just want them. Oh, we could use them. But I'm just saying, whether I can use them or not is beside the point. I just want them. Josh Hewitt, BYU equipment manager. It's almost time. The student managers have been busy. They're getting the slides and shoes and uh, helmets and equipment and and swag for the whole season out. Now, here's the deal. They actually get more in season. Like, they'll go on a a certain road trip, and they'll be like, all right, here's the – Here's what we want you to wear yes. on the plane or to the game and da-da-da. It's good to be on the BYU football team. It's, it's good. Look, let's be honest. It's good to be a Nike school first and foremost. Amen. Uh, I felt something when yes, you said that. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, it's also good to be any sport on campus because you know that that Nike gear is coming and it's free. Uh, like that shirt you have from BYU Baseball. Yes, like this shirt that, that, is I, nice, that I have dude. from BYU Baseball. Like a... Uh, button. It's it's a buttoned collar shirt. It is a buttoned. Like it's more, snap it actually, button. it's a snap. Yeah. It is. It's and it's black. Like I you know, the, the hats have the snap back. Yeah. This is a snap front. A snap front. That's very unique. Uh, so uh, so I have this in black, royal, uh, navy, okay, and gray. You know what? That's enough. Uh, but here's the thing. Four you are of those. <laughs> that's amazing. You did not. You and I did not plan on the the black today. It's a blackout. It just worked out. It's a Tuesday blackout. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Okay. We hope the show doesn't blackout. Uh, here's the lineup. Should the BYU offense be elite? There are a lot of indicators saying yes. Do we agree with that idea? Will I use the E word relative to the BYU offense? Stuart Mandel of the Athletic discusses the latest in conference realignment. It will be great to have his national perspective. And we go live to women's soccer practice. Day one of fall camp for the national runner-ups. Natalie Wells is the only senior on this team. Well, well, well. We'll talk to her. Or uh, Wells, Wells, Wells. Well, well, that's enough. Here are today's headlines. All right. <laughs> Five. B- <laughs> wow. Five BYU football players. You and your land four baseball shirts. <laughs> the pro football focus top twenty-five players at their position. Five top twenty-five players according at the position according to PFF. I like it. Highest is Blake Freeland, sixth-ranked tackle. Uh, in the guard center category, Clark Barrington ranked 12th. Jaron Hall, 17th mm. in terms of quarterbacks. Christopher Brooks, in terms of running backs, number 23. And Puka Nakua in the wide receivers, number 24. That is very, very impressive. More on that coming up in trending a little bit. We'll, we'll dive into what that means coming up in a few minutes. Also, don't forget, as we just mentioned, players report for fall camp tomorrow. Practice is beginning on Thursday. BYU Women's Soccer that holds on, its first Thursday. Thank Thursday. you. BYU Women's Soccer holds its first practice today. As we mentioned, the national runner-ups have their blue and white game on Saturday at 9 Eastern. You can watch it right here on the BYU TV app. The Big 12 and Big East extend their deal in men's basketball. It's a two-year extension of the non-conference scheduling alliance. Oh, an alliance that it's, will actually happen? It's an alliance. They've looked into each other's eyes, and they know. That's how you know. That's how you know. Uh, It will include games in November and December during both the 23-24 season and 24-25 season. It will also increase from 10 to 11 matchups due to the addition of schools to both conferences. It is so fun to have that as a headline. Yes, Let's just say that. That's great. And current golfer David Timmons qualifies for the Utah Championship, which is a Corn Ferry event after shooting a 700 at Talents Cove. Uh, Spencer's probably shot a 700 talent skill before. <laughs> Timmons joins five other former Cougars in the tournament. Daniel Summerhays, Peter Quest, for Perfection, Carson Lundell, Patrick Fishburn, and Zach Blair. And uh, Lilia Naliad tees off in the next half hour with the Utah Women's State Amateur as well, or Amateur, because it's golf. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's what's trending on BYU Sports Nation. All right, with the latest pro football focus, top 25 player ratings, and uh, five Cougars listed on those, by the way. I think Ryan Rico would have been listed a punter had they done punters. He would have been top five. But I digress. 
Not to mention NFL draft projections with Jaron Hall and Blake Freeland as high as first round, not to mention others. And a host of returners. We are compelled to discuss the following today, Jason. Should this BYU offense be elite? Um, yes. And it's not just because of one publication's, you know, idea of what they think BYU should be graded at. It's not just what Pro Football Focus has today in ranking five players, you know, in their top 25 at their positions. It is a combination of a lot of things. As you mentioned, it's draft projections on where some of these guys are expected to be, not just high draft picks, first round draft picks. And there could be multiple first round draft picks in the upcoming NFL draft for BYU football. It's also having an understanding of not just the production that comes back, but when you're talking about the talent combined with the production and what we've seen out of this offensive scheme, and, I, and I've, I've been hounding this for the last year or so, what we've seen now under Aaron Roderick as the offensive coordinator the system is in place. You're not trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And maybe let's try this. Now, there's, there's certain there's things within a game or within a season that you, you add to the mix. But the scheme for what Aaron Roderick wants this offense to look like is in place. It's been in place for more than a season. You've now had success in multiple seasons. So the fact that you have a system that is proven to, to be successful, that you have talent and production that can come back and run said system. Yes, everything points to this offense being elite this year. You will not find bigger fans of Aaron Roderick than the two <laughs> people on this desk right now. The last two years since A-Rod was the public offensive coordinator. Correct. He was the not public primary play caller from Boise State on, with the exception, I believe, of San Diego State and Hawaii. Those were given back. Uh, for those two games. Uh, BYU is 21-4. and four. How does that sound? <laughs> that sounds nice, right? Top 25 finishes in back-to-back -back years. Incredible, right? Second pick in the draft from Zach Wilson, Brady Christensen, this offense, Jaron Hall, and so forth. We know what's going on. I think BYU's got a great shot at being elite this year in the, offensively. How would I quantify that? I don't know. Top 10 and a lot of things that matter. Let's look at some next-level stuff. A lot of people will give you points per game, yards per game. That doesn't take into tempo, into account tempo or more advanced metrics. Let's look at a couple of numbers that really stick out from last year, in my opinion, that tell you kind of what BYU could be again. So pressure rate allowed. How good's the O-line? Fourth in the country, 18% in pressure rate allowed. Amazing. Explosive play rate. Are you getting down the field? Seventh in the country, 15% of the time. Yards per play, one of the simplest metrics, but one that's important. Eighth in the country, 6.8 yards above. It helped that Tyler Algier was the running back, okay? Let's, let's not, uh, you know, dismiss that. Yards per pass attempt tell you how explosive you're going to be. 8.8, .8, fantastic. You want to be north of 8 in that. If you're, if you're in the high 8s, you're in business. Third down conversions. Are you moving the sticks? 18th. Projected 13th in SP+. These tell us what BYU could be again. Because you lose Tyler Algier, you lose Samson Nakua. But that's about it, dog. You bring a lot of people back, which is very exciting. It starts with the O-line. you got to have a great quarterback. You always got both of those. Like, great quarterback and great O-line, which is so exciting. Also, EPA expected points added in both pass and run plays last year. Eighth. Eighth. BYU is, is great in these, and they could be, again, obviously a tough schedule. If BYU's in the top 20, I'm super happy, obviously, because of sort of how much weight you're putting on that bar with this schedule. But BYU's got a legit chance to be one of the best offenses it has had in a long time. All they have to do is keep doing what they've yep. been doing the last two years. Yep. Well, and look, and I'm not naive enough to think that, obviously, BYU's playing some really, really good teams. Yep. And you mentioned the schedule and all of the opponents that are on it. This is a formidable schedule that BYU's playing, to say the very least. I think ultimately, though, what will determine whether or not this team reaches elite status offensively is something that, unfortunately, you just can't predict, and that's injuries. And hopefully that is not something that comes up this year. Yeah. It's something that teams have to deal with. You never know when it's going to pop up, and when it happens, you just do the best that you can to move on. But if this team can stay healthy or relatively healthy at the key positions on offense – then BYU absolutely has a chance 
to put up some big numbers on the offensive side of the football. Christopher Brooks is a massive variable in this conversation. We are expecting him to be a very good player. Pro Football Focus putting him in the top 25 at number 23 among running backs in the country. We're assuming he's going to be really good. Yes. If he is, we're in business. If he's not, there's, there's trouble. But the O-line's so good and Jaron Hall's so good that I think the pressure's not on him to be great per se. Although if he's great, now we're talking, right? Um, and, and to have five guys in the top 25 is awesome. Now, it, it's been rare to go into a season like this, Shep, with a quarterback and uh, an offensive lineman that, that are as highly touted as Jaron Hall and Blake Freeland are. In fact, I think if BYU has a good season, not even great, both these guys are getting drafted next year. I agree with not that. Not to mention Clark Barrington, yeah. which brings us to our stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. In the modern draft era, that is the seven round era, not the like 20 round or 11 or whatever. You always had a quarterback and an offensive tackle specifically taken in the same draft just twice. You go back to 95, Eli Herring, not going to play on Sunday, and John Walsh, and then Zach Wilson and Brady Christensen in 21. It is rare to have what we have going into this season. Think about it. Especially that left tackle, of course. The blind side made famous th this position. Um, and, and so did independent study with BYU in, <laughs> in that story in the blind side. Is here we are with Blake Freeland and Jaron Hall, and that equals something very special going into this year. Well, and the fact that it goes to what we were speaking of over the last couple of years with this scheme under Roderick, if it happens this year, then you're talking about two out of the three years under this scheme where that – is the end goal, or excuse me, the end result. Yeah. It, it speaks, it, it sort of reemphasizes what we've said, that the talent is coming into the program and the scheme is fitting the talent, the talent is fitting the scheme, and it's working. If Jaron Hall is going to be a first-round pick, he's got to be healthy this year. Yeah. Like, he's got to start every game, um, probably. Because you don't want to go into that year going, well, okay, we, we've, we've seen some real injuries. That's something... That is somewhat it, – it, like, injuries are not a thing you can completely control, obviously. Hopefully, Jaron's healthy this year. Jacob Conover has got to be ready. Cade Fennigan is going to press Jacob Conover for that backup spot as well. That's a storyline to watch here in, in, uh, in fall camp, which begins on Thursday. I'm super excited about it because, obviously, Jaron Hall took care of the ball so well last year. The most underrated piece of last year was Jaron Hall's ability to not turn it over and to complete the ball down the field. Like, he took care of the rock, man. And now we have this awesome offensive line, great receivers with Puka Nakua and Gunnar Romney leading the way. Hopefully Puka has a great year. He's probably gone after this year as well as a fourth-year guy. Let's go, man. Let's go. This offense is perhaps the most exciting offense going into a season we've seen in all of independence. Maybe you have to go back to 09 to feel this excited. Maybe 2014, you're walking in with Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams and that crew. And uh, that, that, was, that was an exciting season as well. But, man, let's go, man. Okay, our question of the day. And before we get to that, fall camp starts Thursday. But what is coming up in how many days again? Countdown to the Bulls. 32 days. A Jimmer's worth left until we see Jerry Bohannon and the South Florida, not Aggies, the Bulls. Jerry, don't call me Gary Bohannon. I've been told that's a Dennis Pitt is worth. Although when we did the countdown numerically last year, we did not include Dennis as number 32. Just to point that out. Disappointed his children, I recall that. Question of the day. What would it take for this year's BYU offense to live up to the high expectations? What do you think? Weigh in on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram in the Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. Braden Clark on Instagram, staying healthy. This team is too good to not win at least 10 games. At least nine is kind of the bottom. Yes. Like, let, if BYU goes eight and five, I'm disappointed. This team's too talented for eight and five. We've seen eight and five in independence. Well, and we've had, we've had this discussion. You, at, the, at least the t 10 games, that's, that's where the bigger things start to open up to you if you get to that 10 win mark. There's one thing in particular, Shep. Uh, with no conference uh, you know, uh, affiliation, top 25 ranking is how we can quantify a, right. a, a, a very good to great season. And BYU has done that the last two years. Crazy. Clyde Livingston on Twitter. Once again, Ryan Rico, best football player on the team. Clyde, you get it. You get it, Clyde. 
does not have enough punts to qualify for a national award. <laughs> like, Ryan Rico is going to be the only dude that wasn't like a Ray guy finalist or semifinalist to ever be drafted. Yes. Because his he, team was he, too he good on offense. They just didn't need him. Or it's like, it's like name the Alabama punter. Yeah, I can't see them. Yeah. They, don't, they just don't punt that much. Brian Jacobson on Twitter. I think expectations for the offense are sky high. I think our third down conversion rate and red zone numbers should be top 10 in the country. With experienced starters, we should have that type of consistency. That's the thing, too. Going into a season, a lot of that is based off of who's back and what you know about them. And BYU obviously coming off of 10 wins and having a top 20 offense last year. We expect a lot of things. And we expect them to get even better. Like, Jaron Hall did not throw for 3,000 yards last year or 30 touchdowns. If he's healthy all year, I'm hoping for a 3,500, 30 touchdown kind of year like we saw Max Hall have, kind of his junior, senior years where it was like, big-time stuff, now you're really on the NFL boards, not just because of what you did statistically, but, like, physically who Jaron Hall is as an athlete. Well, and, and it, it again, kind of goes back to, to injuries, not specifically with Jaron Hall, but just throughout the team. Yeah. And obviously, since we're focusing on the offense, if you have your stable of receivers and all of your tight ends, then we know how talented – we haven't talked a whole lot about the, the tight ends in general – or like receivers three through six. That's what I mean. Like yeah. when if you have those guys available to you, when you have a quarterback like Jaron Hall, who you said has proven not only can he can is can he use his arm to make plays, certainly use his leg to make plays, but not turn the ball over, you're allowing the guys around you to help make plays. All of that the only way that happens if guys stay on the field, and that's what you're hoping happens. Yeah. If that happens, Sky's the limit, as, as the guy just said. Another way to quantify Ryan Rico's awesomeness is he might be the greatest weapon on the team. In his ability to pin the other yes. team back. Let's go. Change okay. field position. Weigh in on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All right, coming up. Haven't we seen this before with Zach Wilson? Yes, we'll show you. And Stuart Mandel of The Athletic on the latest in conference realignment, the BYU offense, and more. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. The fall sports season begins Saturday night. BYU women's soccer returning to the pitch for their blue and white scrimmage. You can watch the match live at 9 Eastern on the BYU TV app. I cannot wait for that one. I'll be uh, roaming the sidelines. Can't wait. The national runner up from That's last right. year. What a run that was. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Jerem Jordan alongside Jason Shepard. We now welcome to the program the editor-in-chief of college football on The Athletic, co-host of the Audible podcast. His name is Stuart Mandel, back on the program. Stuart, welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Great to have you. Thanks for having me back. Well, luckily, uh, July and August gave us nothing of interest in uh, college football. Uh, yet, we're going to talk to you. Just kidding. Conference realignment, obviously, the talk of everybody. So what's kind of the latest? What are you hearing uh, and what are you putting out relative to what's going on, especially after Pac-12 Media Days? Actual uh, media days was certainly uh, certainly interesting. Um, I think the next milestone is going to be the Big Ten TV deal, which is supposed to be finalized here in the next couple weeks, and we know it's going to be for a you know un ungodly amount of money. Um, but the more important thing and the ripple effect it'll have on the rest of uh, on on the other conferences and and first up the Pac-12 is who loses out on the Big Ten on the Big Ten deal because that's who's going to be most invested in the Pac-12 and then eventually the Big 12. Um, you know, we're hearing, well, Fox is already, their part of it is already set. Uh, will CBS get a game, get that 330 game? Uh, will ESPN still be a part of it or not? Um, will there be a streaming partner? So we're waiting on that. And then I think once that becomes official, then the Pac-12 TV deal comes to the forefront. And, uh, it's crazy that we're about to start the season. We're sitting here talking about TV deals and Nielsen ratings and whatnot, but that is what really is at the, fo at the focal point of realignment. Well, and Stuart, I mean, look, media days in years past have always been about, well, let's see, who's picked to win this conference and who's expected to be good and who, who's that team that maybe is the sleeper team. Nobody's talking about that anymore. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter which conference media day we were talking about. Nobody was focused on where the teams were expected to finish. It was all about other stuff. How different has this been trying to cover this over the last couple of years? 
Yeah, I hate to say it, but you know, I was at Pac-12 on Friday, and and I feel bad. I didn't interview a single coach or player while I was there. <laughs> um, I had some. I, I didn't. I, I was spent the entire time focused on you know what happens next for the Pac-12, and and uh, and I, I I wasn't at any others this year. Certainly, my colleagues were, um, but I think it was similar. Now, I think that's a shame for the athletes. This is they're not making realignment decisions. They're not even gonna be playing in these, in you know, whatever configuration of these new uh, conference lineups are. This is their chance to, to, to be in the spotlight. Um, but hey, that's <laughs> the people in power are the ones that, that created this dynamic, the Big 10 making this move that they did. Um, you know, this isn't their problem, but you know, Pac-12 Media Days was already scheduled for Los Angeles of all places. And, uh, <laughs> and so obviously that became I mean, I was focused more on what's the next step, but there were obviously a lot of LA media there that were focused on USC and UCLA. So, um, yeah, just just either being there or watching from afar, I think the commissioners who each give their kind of State of the Union address have gotten way more attention. They're, what they've said has gotten the lion's share of attention as a, rather than um, the coaches and the players. It's like people forgot Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams uh, went from uh, Oklahoma know, to right? USC. It's like, oh, yeah, those guys. We're talking to Stuart Mandel of The Athletic. You talked about the dominoes in the next step of these uh, uh, potential conference realignment. Uh, with the Big Ten deal, if they really wanted Oregon and Washington in that league, they would have invited them already, it feels like, because if they're locking up that TV deal, they would have got them. Are they going to do uh, a deal that's longer than, say, five to seven years, or will the door still be open for Oregon and Washington later? Because it feels like that's where we're at. Like, what's going to happen with them that then affects the Pac-12, that then affects the Big 12? Uh, given the success that that the strategy Jim Delaney, you know, did last time with the short-term deal, I would assume they'll do another short-term deal. Now, that doesn't preclude them from adding teams. The, if at any point Notre Dame calls and says we're in, they're in, yeah. right? They'll They'll adjust the TV deal accordingly. But from what I've been told, Fox is not going to pay a dollar more for Oregon, Washington, Stanford, or Cal, you know, some of these schools that have been mentioned. So I'm of the opinion that none of that is imminent, um, but because Kevin Warren kind of left it open-ended in his comments at Big Ten Media, he didn't get up there and say, we're, we're, we're 16, we're done. He said, sure, there could be more expansion in the future. Then because of that, there's just going to be this I feel bad that you know some of these schools are going to live in constant, uh, maybe indefinite um, uncertainty about hey, when are they going to make the next move? When are they going to make the next move? But I agree with you. If they wanted Oregon, Washington, they would have announced that at the same time as the LA schools. One of the big storylines coming out of the Pac-12 media days was the uh, the defiant tone. Um, from uh, Commissioner Klyovkov towards the Big 12. And obviously, you know, this, this is not the first time those two conferences have sort of been pitted against each other. What do you make of, I don't know if you say perceived rivalry, because it really does feel like there's a rivalry. What do you make of this back and forth between the Big 12 and the Pac-12? To me, it feels like, um, look, the Big 10 and the SEC are the ones in charge, and we know that, and they've each weakened those two conferences and what i think is unfortunate is rather than you know kind of teaming together uh and and going up against the bad guys if you will they've turned on each other um and that's a direct product of you know brett yormark the new big 12 commissioner hey we're open for business and he's not hiding the fact that he's going to come after those pac-12 schools and you know we've since through reporting ascertained that that's exactly what they've been doing they've been pers uh, mem not just the commissioner, but people on behalf of Big 12 schools have been reaching out to people on behalf of Pac-12 schools. And then I talk to people in the Pac-12 and they say, why would we do that? We, we don't have any interest in that. We're focused on the 10, uh, keeping the 10 together and seeing what we can do. So um, yes, I expected him to be defiant. I ne didn't necessarily expect him to, to throw out that line about, we haven't decided if we're gonna go shopping there yet or not. Um, people, <laughs> I've, since then people have said, why is he so mad at them? Why isn't he mad at the Big Ten? Well, he's mad at the Big Ten, but it's like that ship has sailed. Um, there's nothing he can do about that now, but he can and is trying to keep the Ten together. And the Big 12 uh, is the conference kind of making the most noise about trying to steal away some of their members. 
What's more likely to you that uh, you know San Diego State or and or somebody else gets in the mix in expansion to either of those uh, the conferences, the Pac-12 or the Big 12, or that the Big 12 actually gets uh, a couple members of the Pac-12? You know, I, I know this is not a popular opinion in, in Big 12 land, but I don't see any of the Pac-12 schools going to the Big 12 for several reasons. But the most pertinent one is the big the Pac-10 Pac-12 media deal is up first. So for them to go to the Big 12, they would not, they would have to do so kind of on blind faith. They won't know for a couple of years what the big next Big 12 media deal is worth. Uh, so I think they will go ahead and sign the, the Pac-12 deal before then. In terms of San Diego State, I mean, the two I hear the most for the Pac-12 are San Diego State and SMU. Um, but it's not obvious that they would necessarily raise their media value. And obviously... This is going to be a smaller contract to begin with than what they would have hoped for with USC and UCLA. And I don't think they're going to um, knowingly cause their own share of, you know, their own share to go from 10 to 12. So uh, the more likely thing to me, but it's still not very likely, is that the Pac-12 makes another run at a couple of the big 12 schools. Um, but but even that, I you know, I'm talking 5%, 10% chance. That's, that's if the Pac-12 is even interested in going back down that road. You know, Stuart, it's interesting because in terms of the G5, now, now that BYU and the other schools that are joining the, the Big 12 are, are into that P5 level, you know, San Diego State really is that school that gets talked about as making the next jump. The other school that you would think would be on the same plane but isn't being talked about is Boise State. Is Boise, I mean, uh, they're in real trouble right now, aren't they, in terms of like a, a, a step up to somewhere else? It, I don't, I don't see either of the two conferences, at least for right now, you know, looking at Boise State. And I'm wondering from their perspective, if they're looking around and going, man, what in the world do we have to do? Yeah, and, and look, the part I hate about realignment is talking about academics. What do I know? <laughs> I'm, sure you can get perfectly, I'm sure you can get a perfectly good education at Boise State, just like you can at a lot of places. So I want to make clear, I'm, uh, this is not my personal opinion, but I've always heard that the uh, both of those leagues um, – don't think Boise State is good enough academically. Take that for what it's worth. Um, there was a time before Texas and Oklahoma that, I mean, do you remember, I think it was 2020, that um, somebody did a public records request and there were emails from Brian Harson, coach at Boise State at the time, to his own AD and president, begging them to get them out of the Mountain West. <laughs> um, and, and the main way, the main um, opportunity at that time was to go to the AAC. Uh, that didn't happen, and now the AAC is not, you know, it's kind of a shell of what it would have been after losing the programs it did to the Big 12. So, no, I think Boise State's best option is still in uh, the Mountain West, um, and they've got to kind of hope that the Pac-12 doesn't uh, step in and, and take some of the top programs from the Mountain West. Ryan Harson got out. He just got out to the tune of uh, many millions of dollars at Auburn. Uh, <laughs> so that's where he got it. We're talking to Stuart Mandel of The Athletic. Uh, let's get a BYU question in here. Crazy. Uh, BYU's walking into a season with a lot of returners, probably a preseason top 25 team, a good schedule. What do you think of the Cougars in 2022? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, last year when they weren't bringing many people back, expectations were very low and they greatly exceeded them. Now they do have a lot of guys coming back and the expectations are going to be higher and can they live up to them? And I certainly think it starts with Jaron Hall. Um, having a, an experienced, talented quarterback like that, um, you know, arguably the most important uh, factor. I'm interested to see what they do at running back. I'm really familiar with Christopher Brooks, formerly Christopher Brown, because I'm here in the Bay Area. And I think he's really talented. He never had a, necessarily a huge season at Cal. Is that because of his own, you know, kind of ceiling? Or is that because Cal's offense, to be blunt, stunk the whole time he was there? And, and didn't necessarily help do him any favors. So the fact that Kalani Sataki has said uh, that he's probably their number one running back, I'm really, that's something that really interests me to see what kind of production he can have um, playing in a better offense. And we're excited about that offensive line of BYU that returns uh, a lot of guys and uh, brings in a five-star from Oregon and Kingsley Suamatia. Well, Stuart, we appreciate the time. Best of luck with uh, trying to cover all this. And oh yeah, by the way, football is coming up in a couple of weeks. Can't wait. Thank you. It's going to be awesome. Thanks, Stuart, Stuart Mandel of The Athletic. You can also check out his 
uh, podcast, The Audible. It's fantastic. Uh, we like the podcast. So, yeah, interesting stuff. We haven't been talking necessarily about the Big Ten TV deal being the first sort of trigger there, but, yeah, they're not, they're not inviting Oregon and Washington right now. It's, it feels like, okay, everyone's going to stay put. That The big move was made. Um, conversations were had, but ultimately we're going to walk into this season as is, which, by the way, the Pac-12 TV deal – is up, uh, you know, a year before the Big 12. So that's why they're working on that. It goes Big 10, it goes Pac-12, it goes Big 12. For years, we've been eyeing sort of this 22 to 24 era. Little did we know, yes, there was conference realignment, and yes, it involved BYU. We're lucky. We, yes, we are. It was <laughs> but glorious, it's still chaotic. It's a glorious, it was a glorious day, to say the very least. All right, coming up, we go live to the opening day of women's soccer practice. Natalie Wells will join us. And did Zach Wilson best his pro day throw in practice yesterday with the Jets? We'll show you the throw. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is brought to you by Marisk, enabling global trade for a growing world. This is BYU Sports Nation to interact and get great content with the show throughout the day. Follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. He is Jason. I'm Jerem. Let's whip it. Good Whip Round is presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. With the Big East and Big 12 extending their basketball scheduling alliance through the 24-25 season. You can't even say that one. <laughs> no, I can't even say it. It's, it's, nice. it's associated with something that's quite comical. Uh, which Big East team or teams, you would like to go multiple teams, do you want to see on the 23-24 or the 24-25 BYU hoop schedule? Sounds like not everybody plays everybody, right? Because they don't have the same amount of teams. Yes, there's not enough. So the hope is BYU is involved here, and if they are, I would love a Butler, Georgetown, or Villanova. Just some of those traditional blue bloods, or in the case of Butler, kind of a newer yes. uh, team that went to two national championships, obviously, and Brad Stevens. That, one of those three would be really fun. Uh, my legit answers would be Georgetown because it's Georgetown. Yeah. That, there's just a mystique yeah. about Georgetown. For sure. And then Villanova, because obviously we know how good Villanova is, even though Jay Wright is no longer there. And they'd play without a shot clock. <laughs> yes. Just uh, yes. ode to the 80s. My smart aleck response is, I hope it's Boise State. <laughs> oh my gosh. Boy State wishes it was Boy State. Wait, is it, are they still in the Big East? Do they? Yeah. But How long were they in the Big East? That's a fun kind of story relative to BYU not going. Zach Wilson had Twitter buzz with his throw yesterday, which is throw in Jets practice to Elijah Moore, and it reminded many of his throw during Pro Day. Which was the better version of the throw? So here's the Pro Day one to Aleva Hefo. Shout out to Aleva. Alumni game MVP. And then yesterday to Elijah Moore. What do you think? Uh, well, this one's pretty easy for me. I am going with the pro day for two reasons. Number one, that got him drafted. Okay, it didn't get him drafted. <laughs> I was like, what? But, what? But that's, that's, wow. that's what people wanted to talk about. It and was, number two, I wild. actually yeah. witnessed the first one. Yeah. I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. It was amazing. So I'm going to go with that one. Certainly the impact of the first one is greater than the second one. I'll go with the second one for this reason. There was an actual defense there. Like, and Elijah Moore still got behind it, and he still made said throw. I don't think it was the same yardage as the uh, as the first, of course, but uh, I'll go with the second. All right, we've talked about it. Uh, we're going to talk with Natalie Wells coming up in our next segment, uh, live from uh, women's soccer practice. Uh, what are your expectations for BYU women's soccer? This year? Certainly losing Michaela uh, Coulihan and Cameron Tucker and Cassidy Smith. Big deal uh, with your with your 10 your two and your striker scores, yep. and your goal, goalie, right? Yep. Um, I, I expect BYU to win the WCC. I expect BYU to win a game in the NCAA tournament. That's always my expectation yeah. for BYU to win soccer. Certainly they feel like, hey, we did this last year. Let's do it again. Those are some big pieces to lose, but BYU's got a lot of talent because yes. you return everybody else. Well, and look, and not only this, and this is one of the hallmarks of Coach Rockwood, she will play young players. She will. So yes. you may have young players. That doesn't mean that they're inexperienced. You have young players, you have a lot of sophomores on this team. Now, granted, COVID plays a role in this because they probably should be juniors. But, right. you, but you, have, you have a lot of sophomores and juniors on this team that have played a lot of, of minutes. But I'm with you. And in the NCAA tournament, yes, that was super absolutely. high level. Look, at yeah. minimum, expectations are you're in contention for the WCC championship. I, I do. I'm like you. I expect them to win it. I go in every year expecting them to win it. And I expect them to, to make to the postseason and make some noise. Yeah. That's what my expectations are for this team. That doesn't change because of the consistency of this program. Yeah, and the really talented group. 
Okay, we've now done an entire whip uh, without talking about a tiki alley, a tiki do jumping, have, do we have or, a video? or big game boomer at all. Is this an accomplishment or a disappointment? Um, I'm going to lean towards accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> I go disappointment. I became very used to one or the other, and we don't have either, so tomorrow. We'll get to it tomorrow. <laughs> All right, coming up, the top five Balsamic goals. Balsamic vinegar? No, no? But that may be on the lunch okay. menu today. Yeah. Uh, the top five goals for BYU women's soccer. And senior Natalie Wells live from women's soccer practice on day one of fall camp from Southfield. We'll go there live next. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Join Dave McCann, Blaine Fowler, and David Nixon tonight as they look back at all the touchdowns from BYU football last season on After Further Review. Watch the show at 7 Eastern on the BYU TV app. There were many of them last year, and a lot from uh, Tyler Algier and Jaron Hall and company, so that should be a lot of fun coming up tonight on the BYU TV app. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. On uh, August 2nd, the day that women's soccer begins its first practice, and uh, it's very exciting. Uh, blue and white game coming up Saturday yeah. on the BYU TV app. Alumni game the next Wednesday. And then they play an exhibition at North Carolina before the regular season opener at Fullerton on August 18th. We now go to Southfield Live with Natalie Wells, who's the only rostered senior on this team, live from day one of practice. Natalie, welcome to BYU Sports Nation. How's day one of camp? It's been amazing. So fun to be back out here with the team, just getting ready to do what we do best. Natalie, what's the what's the weather update? Because when I got to work, there was a lot of clouds rolling in. I, ha I haven't been outside since. What's uh, what? Give us you put on your meteorologist hat. What's what's the weather like out there? Well, you know, I'd say there's about a 50 percent chance of rain. But right now <laughs> we've got some nice cloud coverage and it's a good temperature for some soccer. Very nice. I, it's always good temperature for soccer at Southfield, even if it's raining, right? Which is which is awesome. Yeah. How how soon are we going to see you back out on the pitch? I know you're battling an injury right now. Yeah, so we just talked with the doctor today and we're planning on being back out there for the Cal Fullerton game. Excellent. That's the season opener. So that's a veteran move. You're going to be ready for the regular season. That's great. Um, Obviously a different, a little bit of a different group this year. Although you only lose three players, granted they were massive pieces. What's the vibe like in camp as you guys get ready to defend a WCC title and try and do what you did last year again and make a run in the NCAA tournament? We've got a lot of good new energy and we are super fortunate because most of our freshmen graduated early and so they've been practicing with us since January. So it's been really fun getting to know them and kind of figuring out what our chemistry is going to be this year. And so really we're feeling ready to go and feel like we're not, you know, missing a beat, just jumping right back in since our spring season. Natalie, I know that, you know, last year the players used what happened uh, to end the season the, the, the previous year as motivation. And obviously you guys, you know, played extremely well last year. What type of motivation do you take into this year with how last season ended losing in the title game? Yeah, so last season we really got a glimpse of how much potential we have and how good we can really be. And so going into this year, we kind of have that expectation now and we have that idea and we know what we can do. And so going into this year, we are excited to, you know, just – win the national championship and go one step further than we went last year. Hey, let's go. We're talking to Natalie Wells live from Southfield on the first day of fall camp for the women's soccer team. Will you flip the phone around and give us a sense of what you're seeing out there at Southfield and what's going on? Yeah. There we go. There we have the team doing a drill. Everyone is looking good and having fun. Is, is Greg there? Can you put Greg on the – can we see a picture of Greg? Is he over there? He actually – he just left. Okay. He was here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he'll just join us in studio, I guess. Yeah, he'll just join us in studio. You're right. 50%. <laughs> it might be more than 50%. Yeah, it's, uh, it's cloudy. It might but, be. But uh, obviously you guys had a great spring. I believe you guys didn't lose a game, correct? No, yeah, we had an undefeated spring. And mm. so we're excited to see what the fall holds for us. And then Jamie Shepard, uh, we've talked about it, moving from the 6 to the 10, kind of in that holding mid to attacking mid. That's what she played mm -hmm. until BYU. What kind of impact do you think she's going to have on the team? 
he's such an attacking minded player and is so creative and so good at facilitating things that we're super excited to have her more in the attack and to be able to create so many opportunities to go to goal and score. So we're excited to see what happens. It's time to get, it's time to wake up. By the, way. the alarm's gone up. <laughs> uh, obviously, once you get back out on the pitch, I know you, you want to help wherever you can. What, what role do you expect or what have the coaches talked to you about personally with you and, and the role they expect from you this season? Yeah, so all throughout the spring, I've been playing that center back position next to Lava, Vaka, one of the twins. And in that role, you know, it I've been learning to and being trained in doing a lot of communication, organizing the team in order to have that organization and to help prevent and proactively um, do all we can to keep the other teams out of our back and keep them out of our goal. Lava and Daviana Vaca played with the Tongan national team during the summer, which is pretty cool. What was that like for you guys to go see them rep their national team? It was so awesome and such a cool experience for us to be there supporting them and cheering them on while they were you know, playing with the Tongan national team. And it was so awesome to see them compete at such a high level and perform so well. And they connected on a goal, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that was awesome. Definitely a highlight for us, at least. Give us an idea of some of the young players that fans should pay attention to. I believe there are nine freshmen on the roster. Who are some of the, who are some of the names that, uh, that fans should be uh, paying close attention to as the season gets closer? Ooh, that's a loaded question because they're all so good and all have so much to contribute. Um, some of the names that you'll be seeing, though, for sure, are you've got Izzy Stratton, Aaron Bailey, Ali Fryer, we've got Emma Neff, we've got Bocci, who is currently injured, but she's working her hardest to come back, and we're excited to get her out playing on the field as soon as possible. Who's Bocci? She is one of our freshmen. I'll be honest, I don't know her first name, but we all call you're, her Bocci. You're a senior. You don't have to know the freshman's name. That's fine, right? Yeah, you just know the nicknames. So we're I'm good. Sure. We're good. It's all good. Um, what, what does this team need to accomplish in the next couple of weeks to get ready for the season, in your opinion? In the next couple of weeks we're, weeks, we're focusing a lot on finishing because, you know, as the BYU women's soccer team, we do really well winning the ball from the other team. Ultimately, we, um, we really dictate the game. And so now just we got to put that last piece together and put the goals away. And so if we can do that and if we can – get that um, rhythm building out of the back and starting it from the back and getting all the way to the front, just putting it away with finishing, then we're set. We're golden. With, with your injury and obviously working back to, to getting back to full strength when, when you get back out on the pitch, what, what are you doing to get ready? Is it, is it all about the mental reps? How, how are you preparing yourself until you're able to get back out there? Yeah, so right now I'm doing my best to make sure I'm in shape and that my cardio is at the level it needs to be in order to play in games. And then along with that, it's really important that the whole team's on the same page and we all know the game plan. And so out here at practice today, we're just listening to our coaches and I'm there with them mentally and strategically learning about, you know, what adjustments we want to make and what things we're going to do to um, – pull out the wins this year and so just getting on the same page with our strategy and with our style and then also with cardio are they have been two of the main things that I'm kind of focusing on right now and that's what uh Shep focuses on in the gym as well that's interesting you went on your mission to <laughs> Mongolia what position would Chinggis Khan have played in soccer oh he definitely would have been a striker <laughs> that's for sure right <laughs> That guy was crazy. Totally. He loves all of that attention, all the glory, putting the goals away. Although with this team, it's such an awesome culture because, you know, we really focus on the role that everybody plays in helping us be successful. Well, Natalie, we appreciate it. Best of luck in your recovery. Uh, get ready for that Fullerton game, and uh, we'll see you Saturday at the Blue and White scrimmage. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> Natalie Wells live from Southfield, where it's pretty stormy out there. They're getting after it. I, I mean, I, look, we don't live that far from each other, but I realized that last night, that, last night was yeah, crazy. Was say, like, was it there a was crazy? A crazy. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we had we had uh, furniture flying around. We've yeah. had more. It feels like 
we've had more thunderstorms because Utah doesn't get a ton of thunderstorms. Now yeah. in the Midwest, where you know I grew up, oh yeah, get them all the time, and they're like severe. But it feels like this year we've had more thunderstorms in Utah than I can remember in a long time. It's been wild. Uh, by the way, of the nine freshmen uh, we talked about, um, eight of those are from Utah. The recruiting for BYU women's soccer is not going to change drastically with the Big 12. They already get great talent, yeah. most of which are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that are already coming to BYU, want to come to BYU. That's one sport where it doesn't actually impact it a ton. I think it's more football, men's basketball. Well, and look, about. and you look at all of the soccer clubs within the state and high school. Like, it is legit. Utah's a legit soccer yes. hotbed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. BYU has been here. the beneficiary of a lot of talent in the state of Utah coming to Provo Let's without, without uh, you know, saying the least. All right, coming up, the elite voice of the day. And today's Top 5 Tuesday looks at women's soccer plus a picture of Kalani Satake that is way too cute to not show. Warms okay. your heart. It'll, it'll warm you. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. BYU Sports Nation is on demand. Download the BYU TV and BYU Radio apps today. We can also download the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, rate, and review. Hey, play it at 2x. You know what I'm saying? Just speed that puppy By the way, up. how did you say Genghis Khan? Genghis Khan. Okay. That's how you say it in Mongolian, apparently. Did you look that up? No. No. I've talked, I've talked to people. Okay. You've time not for, talked to anybody. It's time for t- <laughs> I'm, never t- I'm not talking to you again. <laughs> time for Top 5 Tuesday. This week in honor of women's soccer practice starting, we look back at the regular season. The top five plays from last year. We start with number five. Number five. We're talking again. Yes. Olivia Wade sends it deep over the USC defenders to a waiting Brecken Mazingo. Corrals it and sends it in like a rocket for the score. It was the Cougars' first goal of the game and Brecken's first of seven goals on the season. Look at that. With the left foot, far post. We'll see more from this game a little later. That's a former UCLA player as well. Yes, it against is. Against USC. Number four, October 9th. Hey, Brecken Mozingo sends across to the far post, bounces off the belly of Michaela Coulihan, her ninth goal of 18 eventually in the season. She had a brace that night in a 6 0 win against the Terrells. Number three, back to the USC game where Brecken Mozingo. Sensing is a thing. Is this here, a Brecken Mozingo? Puts a thing? beautiful free kick into the box. Look at that. Bella Felino heads in the game winning goal perfectly placed. Bella ended up with nine goals on the season and looking to improve on that number this fall. Number two, freshman Olivia Smith's chip shot versus St. Mary's. This was awesome. Falling to the right side, up and over the goalie, into over the outstretched glove for the goal, her first goal of her BYU career. That was in a 7 0 shutout against the Gales. Oh, by the way, four goals from Cameron Tucker in that game, tying a BYU record. And finally, at number one, we turn to the regular season finale versus the Waves of Pepperdine with the share of the conference title on the line. The Cougs and Waves went scoreless to extra time. Cam Tucker sent a deflected free kick into the bottom right corner for the golden goal, earning BYU a share of the WCC championship. That was a massive moment. Think about it. BYU in the WCC, it's so good, they shared the title. Also, when you're really excited, just jump into people. I also love after, like, just this this emotional moment, you just run away from everybody. I just love it. Don't touch right. (laughs) Don't touch right. Our question of the day, what will it take for this year's BYU football offense to live up to high expectations? We're going off the board for our elite voice of the day. Presented by Sundance Mountain Resort. This is coming from Kevin Knight, an Atlanta Falcons reporter who tweeted his uh, his handles at Falcoholic, Kevin. <laughs> the Falcons running game is clearly a work in progress, but the consistent standout now that pads have come on have been rookie running back Tyler Algier. Mm. We know him. He's a friend from work. He absolutely leveled linebacker Nate Landman, who's a good tackler on a, a run late in practice. As expected, the pads and contact helped him. Buy stock in Tyler Algier, football fans. Yes. Yes, Tyler Algier uh, putting in that work. Okay, today's Rise and Shout Out, presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Timberly Sky, Timberly uh, Satake, uh, Kalani's wife, put out this picture. Oh, look at that. Of that Kalani is awesome. and the new baby. Oh, that baby is smiling. Now, scientifically, that's an accident, but is it? Now, I don't actually believe Kalani's asleep here. Do you, you? think this is, po- you I, think I, this I, is I, fake? I, uh, a little bit. 
But it's too cute not to appreciate. I, I'm, Either way. I'm venturing to say he is asleep. <laughs> That's fantastic. You work in those power naps whenever you can get them. That is the, true. As the head coach about to go into fall camp, that's the Saying. last time these two are going to sleep for a while. Our right, thanks to today's guests, Stuart Mandel and Natalie Wood. Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Always use hashtag BYUSN. Sorry to Dennis Pitta, we ran out of time. For Jason, I'm Jeremy. Shout out to Lindsey Lizenby. Hey, football reports tomorrow. Let's go. Go Cougs. And shout out Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan.